Okay, can you hear me? It's okay? Cool. Okay, so first of all, thank you to the organizers for giving me the chance of this roughly 15 minutes talk. My name is Mattia Conte, I am a researcher in Napoli. I work with uh, Mario Nicodemi, and the topic is genome 3D organization rather than, say, protein, strictly speaking, and application of model from polymer physics to understand the mechanisms underlying. But before getting started, please let me acknowledge the people in the audience that uh, work in this field, in the same field, they gave important contributions of, in the last years from Dave Tirumalai to Professor Onuchi, oh, the pronunciation is correct, and uh, Michele Di Piero, of course, I, I also met new friends like Kirill, and uh, Scolari and Mariano, who is an old friend, and so on. So, cool. Before talking of models and mechanisms and going into the mess, let's start from the data, the experimental data nowadays available on the structure of chromosomes. Because in the last 15 years, there, is, there was a huge revolution in the field because now we have quantitative data on the structure of the genome. So there are many techniques. Uh, I'm focusing on IC, but there are many, many others. What you see in the middle of the slide, I hope the pointer is working somehow. This is the average contact matrix of an entire human chromosome. In this example is the human chromosome 14. Now, on the x-axis of this map and on the y-axis, you have the genomic coordinate of the chromosome. And each window, each entry of the map is the average contact frequency between two any pairs of sites of the chromosome. So, for instance, the red and the green, which can be, for instance, a pair of a gene and a distal regulator. And so, if you look to this map, you can immediately tell that uh, this is not random contact. There is specificity. There are specific block of contacts, not only between gene and regulators, but between to any pairs of sites, okay? And these blocks extend through all the scale of the chromosome. For instance, you can see that there are some regions that tend to strongly interact with each other because they are found frequently close in 3D space. Those are colored in a dark red. And there are other regions where contacts are much depleted in this whitish color. Okay, and if you take a zoom within this map, so you go to the mega base scale, which is the relevant scale where the interactions of genes and regulators typically occur, you can see that uh, the, the same game is found. I mean, the genome is folded, the chromosome, in these blocks of contact which are typically called the TADs, that means topologically associating domain. And my stupid cartoon just want to give a, roughly an immediate idea. So the chromosome basically is folded into blocks of interactions, and these TADs are fought to favor the interactions. For instance, they are thought to be biological, super important, because the regulators within the TAD can more easily find the gene, because that's a region where contacts are much more likely, okay. And so let's go, the, the take home message of the slide is first, we have data on the structure of the genome, quantitative experiments. And second, the emerging picture is that chromosomes have a complex 3D architecture that is functional because controls, for instance, gene regulation. So the question is, what is the origin? What is the mechanism or the mechanisms underlying? So what is, if you want, the invisible hand that drive the formation of those patterns that are not random in the maps? And so a few years ago, that is now more or less 15 years ago, we proposed a very basic scenario of contact formation that is based on polymer physics because we are theoretical physicists, DNA is a polymer, we want to use the physics of the polymers to try to understand the system behavior. And the idea of our model, that is the strings and binders polymer model, it's summarized in this cartoon in the top of the slide. So suppose that you have two sides on the on DNA filament that need to find with each other. They need to establish a contact, for instance, a gene and the regulator. So if you like borrow some concepts from theoretical physics, physics, sorry. If there are two distant guys that need to engage in interaction, maybe there is something, a field in the middle that is mediating the interaction. Okay. Of course, in the reality of cells, that could mean that you have a particle, you have a, a protein that is bridging the interaction between these sides. And so if this is true, you can build a model from physics that is this one, so the strings and binders, as I said, that is pretty easy to understand. So the chromosome is a polymer chain. On the polymer chain, you have specific binding sites, those in reds, for some molecular diffusing binders that are diffusing particle, and that they can recognize their red sites on the chain and they can loop the polymer, they can form specific contact. Okay, by skipping all the technical technicalities in this case, let's see the phase diagram of this 
toy homopolymer model I'm discussing. On the x-axis, you have the number, so the concentration of the binder, how many binders you put in the system. Whereas on the y-axis, you have the affinity, which means the strength of the attractive energy of the binders to the red binding sites of the polymer. And, and so you can see that if you have just a few binders or the energy is not enough, they do not manage to fold the polymer, which stays in a randomly free open conformation. Technically speaking, it's a self-avoiding walk chain. But if you increase number or affinity of the binder, there is a precise threshold by which they crumple the polymer into a specific globular conformation. So in other words, that's a coil to globular phase transition. And why I'm wasting too many words on this toy model? Because this means, in principle, that to change the conformation of the polymer, so of chromatin, you just need to up or down regulate the genes that produce the binder or change their chemical interactions, which means the y-axis on the, on the, on the y-axis indeed. And so that's pretty interesting. And uh, if you consider a basic variant of this stupid toy model that I discuss, you can immediately realize that you can explain qualitatively the pattern that you see in the data, say the, say the TADs or whatever you want. Indeed, supposed to have now a block copolymer model with two types of binding sites, the red and green, and just switch on the interactions between red binders and red sites and the green green, of course, in the steady state, molecular dynamics or whatever you want, you will have a conformation that is split, is phase separated into distinct globules, the red phase and the green phase. So the contact map is something like that, uh, two square blocks of interactions, and you can tell that this is pretty similar to what the biologists find in the experiment. Those are TADs. And so, to cut short the longer story, the folding process that is envisaged by the model is a process of, say, microphase separation, whereby the binders phase separate the polymer into distinct globules because of local abundance of coagulate binding sites. Okay, so at a qualitative view, it seems it works, but I don't want to give the impression that this is just toy model, this is just qualitative, because if you consider more sophisticated polymer chain with more colors, you can explain quantitatively the data emerging at the population average level, such as I see and so on. And I'm also referring work of other groups in the field that uh, uh, more or less had a similar approach, say. And just to set the stage as an example, I'm showing here the average contact map of a six megabase wide region around the FF4 gene. It's super important. If I have time, I will tell you more later. This is a real experiment, and this is what you have with a microphase separation based model. So there is no loop extrusion, there is no such a mechanism, just the self interaction, the interaction of self interacting polymer chains, once you understand how to put the colors, at least structurally speaking, can naturally explain the formation of TADs, loops, and whatever you want in the contact map with quantitative accuracy. Now, of course, I'm skipping all details because there are questions like uh, on the colors of the polymer. So how many colors you need? Uh, how do you choose the colors on the chain? And what do they mean? Okay, what is the molecular interpretation? Uh, say, I have no time to go through the detail, but just to give the rough idea. The idea is that, that instead by putting by hand the color on the polymer, you can let the machine doing it. So if you combine, say, the polymer physics with the standard optimization protocol, such as in our case, Monte Carlo simulated annealing, you can identify the optimal, which means the minimal set of colors, subtypes on the chain, in order to explain the data. And I can tell you more, much more later if you're interested. Because the very focus of the remaining time of my talk is, is the following, is single cell. Because so far, uh, we just match it with population average. So what happens when you average the contact across the cells. But now microscopy in the last years made huge improvements, and now we have quantitative data on the interactions and on the 3D structure at the single DNA molecule level. That's pretty much interesting and exciting for us as a physicist, because this means that we can test this process of microphase separation at the level of the single DNA molecule. So the idea is the following, in a nutshell. You can take the 3D conformation of the experiment, microscopy, and you can see whether they match or not the ensemble of 3D structures predicted by the theory. This is a quite dense slide that summarizes some of the work we did recently. Uh, I just want to guide you, don't have time to discuss details. Let's start on the left-hand side of the slide. 
this is a genomic region that we consider where such microscopy data are available at a very good resolution. We consider also other cases. And you see below the uh, binding domains of the strings and binder model of this locus. So there are four colors, the green, the red, the yellow, and the blue, say. And you see that if you simulate this polymer, molecular dynamics, so you let the same colors interact with each other, and you go in the phase separated, say, state, you can see that at the average level, the map of contact is consistent with the average picture, with the, the average matrix. But what we did was to compare, I can tell you later the detail, the single cell structures with the single molecule conformation. This is an example of best match from the experiment and the theory. This is another example, experiment and theory. And so we took all the pool of single molecules in our model, and we performed all the calculations done in the microscopy paper. So we compute, that's quite technical the boundary probability, the separation score, the degree of variability, root mean square displacement, whatever. And we found a good quantitative consistency between our models and what was found in the experiment. So the take home message is that beyond average, we have a quite good impression that this process can be a reliable process at the single molecule level to explain the formation of content. And uh, let's, let's tackle another open question. I'm mostly concluding that is, uh, what is the meaning of the color? You find four colors in your model, okay, but what do they mean? What, what do they are? I mean, the binder, what is biologically speaking? And so, we tackled this point genome-wide recently in a, in a paper, but the idea is the following. So, to consider the green binding domain. You can correlate, you can perform a correlation between the green binding domain and all the available chip sec tracks that you have on the locus or chromosome that you are studying. And you can do this for all the binding domains. And what we find is not trivial, because we don't see that the green is correlated with one specific factor, but each domain is correlated each with a specific distinct combination of factors. So you can see that, sorry, I made a mess. I tried to, to be good enough to not waste time. Let's see, good. So the green, you can see, is correlated with CTCF, but also with coasin, but also with K4M3, and so on. The red is correlated with uh, uh, K4M1, with coasin, and with other factors. So we establish a signature associating to each binding domain a one-dimensional epigenetic signal to, to give an interpretation. And uh, just to give you an idea, we, we saw in this case that uh, some domains, the green and red, were particularly associated with the coasin. And so we performed the simulations by uh, pushing down below threshold, if you want, the affinity for the, uh, the green and the red. So we are mimicking basically a coasin depletion experiment. And we did this and we compare against independent data, having coasin depleting data, and the uh, take-home message is that we found, by the basic ingredients of the model, the same scenario. Because as you know better than me, at the average level, when you remove coasin, there are no patterns. But we need to go beyond the average interactions, because single cell shows that when you remove coasin, you still have pattern in single molecule. And we provide an interpretation for that, because when we run the simulation without coasin, we found in most cases some random conformations consistent with the role of coasin in shaping patterns. But in some other cases, we also found some phase separated globules in single molecule that were found also in single cell. And this is consistent with the fact that there is other, an entire world beyond coasin that shape at the single molecule level the patterns. Of course, if 80% of the conformation are self-avoiding, as we find in the model consistent with the experiment, when you average, you lose information because the contact pattern is structureless, because 80% is random. But the remaining 20%, which is not an error of the experiment, can be explained only going beyond cohesion-based modeling by taking, considering other models. Sorry, because the last part was quite technical. I don't have time, just want to wrap up and say that uh, other mechanisms now are clear that play a role be beyond, say, some, some other that have been proposed. And just to set the stage, we also mixed the loop extrusion and phase separation in a recent paper and found some other nice results. And finally, why this is useful? Because if you have models validated at the single molecule level, you can make applications. You can make, for instance, in our case, predictions of what happens when a mutation impacts genome 3D structure. Mutation that are disease-associated phenotype causing. Of course, thank you all for listening. Apologize if I'm too late. These are the list of collaborators, Mario in Napoli, and the experimentalists in Germany, like Pombo, but also Stefan Mundlos, Bingren, but also Longkai in the US, Giacomo Cavalli in France, and uh, that's a view of my city. Thank you again.
Hi, Sutra. Yeah, short answer, short answer is yes. Indeed, that's our project in collaboration with Giacomo. And we are working on this multi-way content, which means beyond pairwise, if I understood the question. Yeah, yeah. yeah so the, the answer. Yeah, maybe yeah, we can talk later. Hi, my name is Bernardo, and uh, I'm going to talk about open questions that exist and our understanding behind DNA-DNA proximity uh, ligation assays. Um, in high C, uh, DNA is cross-linked, then chopped with restriction enzymes. Uh, afterwards, these uh, free ends are, are capable of forming ligations that then end up uh, populating a map, just as we see here with the, these beautiful, rich checkerboard patterns. And uh, these checkerboard patterns uh, provide evidence for long-range interactions in chromatin, uh, such as domains and loops and compartments. Uh, so this is, uh, this is great because it provides a wealth of information, uh, but there are open questions that we would like to address, and we'd like to get a molecular physics understanding of uh, issues such as that of cross-linking, exactly what is being cross-linked. Is DNA being cross-linked to DNA, to proteins, or to higher order structures? And also, maybe, what's the probability of ligation as a function of Euclidean distance? And so, we use uh, molecular dynamic simulations in order to address these questions. Um, one way of thinking about uh, cross-linking is to entertain the notion that, um, uh, uh, is to entertain the notion that, um, um, DNA is cross-linked with the short-range protein bridges of a handful of proteins or so. On the opposite end of the, uh, of the spectrum, we can entertain DNA being cross-linked to a protein matrix that percolates across the physical extent of the nucleus with a certain rigidity, a, a mesh of, of, of proteins. And this is the idea that we explore in this project. Um, so we mimic the, the, the three steps of the, of, of the experiment, cross-linking, to this uh, protein matrix, chopping with restriction enzymes and ligations, we do this at a nucleosome resolution over structures that are over a megabase uh, long. So this is what it looks like. We start with an initial native structure. Each bead here represents a nucleosome. Uh, we cross-link some of these uh, nucleosomes, which means that they're now fixed in place, pinned to the matrix uh, of proteins, and then we chop some of these bonds at random, now we have some uh, segment ends that are available for ligation. We evolve this stuff in time, and now if two ends come into close physical proximity with a certain probability rate, they may form a ligation, with that, which then populates a contact map. Um, so this is what the results of our uh, numerical experiments look like. We can, do, we, we can mimic ensemble high C by repeating this experiment over ensembles of different structures, and we recover the nice checkerboard pattern with uh, tads and domains. But we can also do this over single structures uh, to, to mimic a single cell high C, but with the advantage that we can repeat the same experiment over and over again on the same structure, which cannot be done experimentally. We can recover uh, the, the typical power loss scaling for contact probabilities, but we can do something else that cannot be done experimentally, which is assess the ligation probability as a function of Euclidean distance. And our experiments revealed that uh, these ligations take place over a, a scale of 20 nanometers or so. Uh, now, the same uh, chopping and diffusion mechanisms that are inherent to high C also take place naturally in DNA that is degrading in time. Um, so, in, in the, the, the high C experiment was, was carried out on, on uh, dead skin cells of uh, woolly mammoth. And uh, lo and behold, against, you know, after 50,000 years, we recover a checkerboard pattern which is remarkable and amazing, and it, it, and it raises a question. How come this wealth of, of structure and information has been pres preserved up to thousands of years? And we can address this question by, by simulating the degradation uh, process of DNA. We start with a native structure, chop all the bonds, let, the, let this gas of nucleosomes diffuse away, and we can see how the map degrades with increasing diffusion. 
And what we see is that to the extent that the, that the woolly mammoth map preserves some measure of structure at all, things mustn't have to fuse significantly through tens of thousands of years. In fact, less than 50 nanometers or so. And with that interesting uh, puzzle, I want to thank everybody involved in the project and to you for listening to my talk. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. If anyone has a question. Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't remember exactly the exponent, but it's consistent with, with, uh, with I mean, the, the ones that we recover are consistent with the experiment. I don't remember the, the exact number. Uh, yes, sure. maybe the next speaker in can also. Okay. Sorry? What trajectories? Oh, what, what set of structures you mean? Yeah. Uh, well, we use uh, structures that resemble uh, one megabase region of chromosome seven for, hum for lymphoblastoids. And where are you getting it from? Uh, from, a, from a model called NuChrome that, that inverts high C maps, yeah. Thank you again. <laughs> now the next speaker is uh, Lucid Hermini. Um, Hello everyone, I'm Lucid Hermini from uh, Laboratoire Charles Coulant in Montpellier, and I will talk today about a recent work where we show how to extract polymer properties from uh, high resolution microscopy data. So as it has been nicely introduced before, uh, chromatin actually um, shapes in a hierarchical way, ranging from uh, chromatin fiber to the uh, chromosome. And here we are interested in the uh, TAD level. And TADs have actually been uh, discovered 15 years ago uh, via high c uh, measurements. And actually what high c showed is that there is an enrichment of uh, frequency contact in those domains. And it, also gave, uh, it has also gave some evidences about the fact that uh, chromatin shapes as a, a fractal globule, which is a model introduced by Grossberg, uh, Grossberg and collaborators in the uh, late 80s. However, recent advances in uh, multiplex uh, in situ fluorescent uh, hybridization has given the opportunity to get uh, um, mean uh, uh, average distance, pairwise distances between uh, fluorescent probes that are distant of 30 kb long, uh, along the, the DNA, and also to recover uh, the uh, footprint of high C, uh, uh, high C maps with uh, much less uh, cells. But beyond these average uh, distance, uh, pairwise distances, each pixel of the uh, matrix actually encapsulates a whole distribution of uh, pairwise distances. And uh, the question uh, we asked ourselves is what these distributions can tell us about the 3D chromatin organization. So if you look at, the, um, at these blue uh, distribution, you can see that they are composed of uh, uh, a, a big uh, Gaussian distribution that, is, uh, that has a long shoulder going to the big distances. So this suggests that, you can, that these uh, distributions are actually composed of a linear combination of two Gaussians with uh, two uh, average radii, R alpha and R beta, and weighting factor F alpha. So what we did is that we took some experimental data from bin two uh, collaborators, and we tried uh, first to uh, fit them with a simple Gaussian model. And as you can see, you cannot recover the experimental points with, uh, with this distribution, and it was expected. But when you introduce the two phases model, uh, the, the red one is the alpha phase, and the blue one is the beta phase, you can see that the, compos the composition of the two in black uh, recovers very well the uh, experimental data. So now here, we, we did it on uh, pairwise distance between uh, probe 20 and first neighbor 21, but you can do it for all other uh, pairwise uh, configurations, and uh, you always fit well the data. And now you can uh, report these uh, R alpha and R beta uh, values in a log-log plot with respect to the genomic distance. 
and what you can see is that the alpha phase actually evolves uh, with, the, with the scaling of the third with the genomic distance, while the blue uh, phase, which is the big radi uh, radius uh, phase, uh, is uh, rather constant. So what is the, what is the uh, physical picture of these two phases? For the first one, it seems like it's the, uh, the classical uh, fractal globule, but uh, the beta phase is uh, somehow uh, more atypical, and it may, may be explained by two uh, pictures, either a polymer trapped in a spherical-shaped uh, uh, potential, which is in this context could be a, a microphase separation, or uh, a rosette-shaped polymer, which is composed by a bunch of, uh, of uh, loops uh, which, ha which have the same uh, origin. Uh, and uh, finally, we wanted to know if our uh, model can give some uh, prediction on single cell data. So we defined a probability uh, beta for uh, a segment of chromatin to be in phase beta, which means in, within uh, decondensed phase. And uh, we compared this, uh, this uh, beta uh, probability with uh, an, an experimentally uh, an, an experimentally uh, observable, which is the uh, sliding uh, radius of gyration in single cells, and you can see that peaks of uh, the beta phase co-localize with uh, the big uh, radi radii of gyration. And with that, I would like to thank you and thank my uh, collaborators in Louvain, uh, teammates in Montpellier, and if you are interested in this method, you can see our uh, recently published uh, paper in uh, PRE. Ah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Unfortunately, there's no time left for questions, because maybe you can wait until the coffee break. Uh, so now the next speaker is Marco Capitano, and it will be a long talk, 20 minutes. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? I, I don't hear very well. Okay. So, first of all, thanks to the organizer for uh, allowing me to, to do this uh, talk today. It's a very, very interesting meeting. And uh, so, in my lab in, uh, in Florence, in Italy, it's the Molecular and Cellular Mechanobiology Lab. So, uh, we study mechanobiology, and uh, today I'm going to present mostly our results on, on single molecule studies uh, uh, using uh, optical uh, manipulation. And uh, so uh, mechanics, of course, is, is uh, uh, very important in biological systems. And uh, movement is one of the, um, the things that uh, characterize uh, uh, all organisms, from, uh, uh, from organisms to, uh, to smaller scale, like uh, single cells can move. And if you uh, look inside cells, there are many enzymes, uh, molecular motors that transport material uh, inside the cell. And uh, so during the years, we, ha we have been working uh, on uh, uh, several systems trying to understand uh, not only movement, but also how mechanics regulate biological uh, system. And to this end, we, we have been using, uh, uh, since a long time, optical uh, tweezers for the few who doesn't know what, what they are. Essentially, they are a, a laser beam, which is totally focused by a microscope objective. And so in the focus of the beam, you have a gradient of intensity of the electromagnetic field and the interaction of uh, this electromagnetic field with the electric particles creates stable trap. So we can, uh, we can uh, uh, like uh, manipulate uh, um, micrometer sized object. Uh, we usually use uh, small bits that we use as handles to, to manipulate biological molecules. And uh, so the range of forces is, uh, is very, uh, um, it's very good to study uh, single molecules. 
And uh, um, several years ago, now we, we developed this technique that we called ultra-fast force clamp spectroscopy, and the name uh, is uh, because of the analogy with ultra-fast spectroscopy in which you excite molecules with light and you look at the relaxation time of the, uh, of the fluorescence. Here you excite molecules mechanically with a constant force, and you look how it responds, how a, a by molecular interaction respond. And uh, in this uh, configuration, uh, uh, this configuration is used to study interactions between a, a, a biological polymer and uh, in interacting protein. So the biological polymer can be a cytoskeletal uh, filament like actin, microtubules, or uh, can be also a nucleic acids polymer like DNA or RNA something like this. And uh, uh, so we started uh, by studying uh, interaction between actin and myosin, and essentially we trapped the, the, the filament between uh, two beads. The two beads are trapped by two optical tweezers, and we have a very uh, fast uh, uh, force clamp, so a feedback system that clamp and fix the force on, uh, on each bead to a constant value. And uh, the, the, we clamp the force on the two beads to two different values so that the net force applied to the filament is different from zero. So what happens to this filament when it is in a viscous solution, uh, it starts to move in the direction of the force, and when it reaches some displacement, we switch the force in the opposite direction. So essentially we alternate the force back and forth, and we wait for the molecule to bind. And uh, so the kind of uh, uh, experimental traces that we, we see is uh, our, a triangular wave, constant velocity, is the movement of the beads against the constant uh, force. When the molecule binds, we switch to a constant displacement because the, the, now the molecule is uh, uh, contracting the force applied by the tweezers. And when the molecule uh, detaches, uh, the system starts to oscillate again. And uh, so this uh, system uh, is quite uh, useful and we have been using for many years because it has a very high temporal resolution. So we can detect uh, very short interactions because of this high signal to noise ratio that we, that we have in the detection of the, of the interactions. So we are on the order of uh, tens of microseconds. And we can also study conformational changes of proteins occurring after the binding against a, a constant force. So essentially we, we can study the mechanochemistry of, of the interaction. And uh, this has been applied to several systems. In the beginning uh, to skeletal muscle myosin, so the myosin that uh, uh, allows our muscle to, to contract. And in this case, we could, uh, in these uh, single traces, we could see the, uh, the interaction of the myosin and the conformational change, the small step, uh, is about five nanometer step of, of, uh, of myosin. And we could study how this is uh, changed by a, a force. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, in the years, we have applied this also to cardiac myosin in collaboration with the Yale Goldman Lab, and also to other kind of uh, myosins, like processive uh, myosins, like myosin 5B. This was done in collaboration with Jim Seller's lab at NIH. And in this case, you can see the, the processive stepping of the motor against the resistive or uh, uh, assisted by, by a, a forward. Uh, force. And uh, just to, to give you another um, example of the applications, we, we, we also applied this to the interaction between uh, DNA and transcription factors. So in this case, you, you can actually scan the, the DNA sequence and look how the, the protein switch from a non-specific binding along the DNA to, sp to specific binding to sequence uh, uh, that are specific for the transcription, for the transcription factor. So in the more recent uh, Years we, we are now focused on studying uh, the propagation, uh, mostly the propagation of signals uh, uh, between cells and inside cells, how this happens. Uh, mechanical signals are fundamental also to, uh, to regulate the, the transcription of, uh, of uh, genes and change really the, the fate of cells. And um, in particular, now we are trying to, uh, to focus on what happens uh, in, a, 
in, in a tissue when adhesin cells, uh, they are attached one to, to each other and how the force are transmitted uh, between cells. And uh, um, more specifically, one, one issue that we would like to, uh, to uncover is uh, how uh, uh, cells, a collective of cells regulate cells in, in its motility. So it's well known that when cells are grown at low density, uh, they move uh, a lot. This is a movie of about two days of uh, uh, a cell monolayer, epithelial cell monolayer. What happens is that at the beginning, the cells move a lot when the density is low. And uh, as the density increases, the, the velocity decreases and they get stuck. So they switch from a, a so-called fluid state to a solid state. And this switch is not uh, related just to the density because this uh, fluid state can be reactivated also at high density. So it's something related to the, probably, what we, we, we think, to the forces that uh, are acting among uh, cells at cell-cell adhesions. So th this is why we, we, are, um, we have been working on understanding uh, how uh, the cell cell additional complex interacts with the actin cytoskeleton. So in this case, uh, in uh, Hadrian's junctions, uh, you have a cell that are connected to, through the e -hadrins. And these e -hadrins can be connected to the actin cytoskeleton to the beta and alpha catenin complexes. And uh, it's supposed that this link is very important uh, to, uh, to change these fluid to solid states because uh, you, can, uh, you can imagine that if there is no link to the cytoskeleton, the hadrian can, uh, can move inside the, the, the bilayer uh, of, the, of the plasma membrane, whereas when they, they are blocked to the actin cytoskeleton, the system can, be, can become more rigid. So, this is why we reconstructed uh, in vitro the interaction between beta alpha catenin to, uh, to actin using our uh, optical tweezer assay. And so we started to study how the single beta catenin alpha catenin uh, heterodimer uh, uh, interacts with a single actin filament. And uh, actually, we were quite surprised to see that, uh, that this interaction is very, very weak. So as we, uh, the, the, the the duration of the interactions is quite short, but as you increase the force, the duration of interaction decreases, and it decreases exponentially. So this is a plot of the lifetime of the interaction versus the force, and this is a log scale, so the decrease is exponential, and it's quite symmetric. So this means that this is a slip, a slip bond that does not allow to resist large forces. Um, and uh, actually, if you look at the details of, of those interactions, this is a zoom uh, of, uh, of one interaction, you see they are very brief and they are not uh, a, a fixed position, but the, the, during the interaction, the, the protein really jumps uh, uh, in, in small steps that we can analyze. So we can analyze the distribution of these steps and we see that it's very periodic. And this periodicity, it's really uh, uh, the periodicity of the actin filament. So uh, what we see in these uh, experiments is that the, 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 the heterodimer binds to actin and uh, it starts to be dragged by uh, the, the force uh, and jumps from one monomer to the other along the filament. So it's, it's like it maintains the contact, but it, it, it slides uh, in, the direction, in the direction of the force. So, and we wanted uh, uh, to, uh, to understand uh, uh, how is it possible that in cells, uh, the, the cells then can maintain a strong bound to, to the cytoskeleton. And uh, so in cells, however, there is not just a single molecule, of course, there, there is an ensemble of molecules. So we uh, tried to see if there is some cooperative effect between multiple molecules and acting as which this bond and to become stronger and actually by increasing uh, the concentration of molecules, what we see is a very different uh, behavior because as we increase the force, now the, uh, um, the length of the interactions increases. And uh, uh, we can also 
um, construct uh, a, a filament in which we know the polarity of the filament, so where is the minus end and the plus end of the filament, and uh, we, can, we, we could measure how the lifetime of this uh, complex, uh, this, uh, um, this ensemble of molecules uh, uh, changes with the force, uh, and uh, the result is very different from the single molecule. So actually, uh, for forces applied towards the, the minus end of the actin filament, you have an increase in the lifetime, so the bond becomes a catch bond, a strong bond, whereas this doesn't happen when the force is applied towards the plus end. And this has some biological uh, uh, significance because in the cells you have uh, no muscle myosin, myosin 2, which uh, uh, apply forces to the actin cytoskeleton towards the minus end of the actin filaments. So uh, in the end, we, we ended up with this, uh, with this model. So we believe that in cells, this uh, transition between uh, fluid and solid uh, state uh, is regulated by uh, the density and clustering of uh, these alpha cathenin complexes. So when you have low density, actually, even if you apply force, you have a fluid-like uh, state, so the connection is, uh, is slipping. And uh, whereas when you have an ensemble of molecules and you apply forces towards uh, when uh, my, no muscle myosin is applying tension on the actin cytoskeleton, uh, the system uh, force plus clustering goes in a solid-like uh, in a solid-like state. And so, uh, with this, I, I conclude, and I want to thank all the people uh, in my lab uh, and the collaborators and foundings. And thank you for your attention. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, if you suppose that the slip bonds, uh, the, single, uh, the single molecule has a slip bond, if you sum up many slip bonds, you end up with a slip bond again. So there must be some cooperativity in, the, in, in this. Uh, and uh, um, so actually, uh, also from the biochemical point of view, you, seem, you see that the interaction is cooperative, so that there is some kind of cooperativity. Uh, there are... Uh, uh, this cooperativity is not well understood. There are several hypotheses, different hypotheses. Uh, it could be that the molecule interacts between, it, between themselves to change their, um, their uh, interaction. I didn't show the results, but if you, um, uh, this alpha catenin can also dimerize if it's alone, and the dimer is a catch bond. So two molecules are enough to to switch to this, uh, uh, to this catch bond, and when they are attached together, they, they switch to a catch bond. So it's possible that this, this, uh, something happens between the, the molecules that change uh, the, the, their behavior. Uh, yes, so Alex Dan made uh, similar experiments with catenin and with vinculin, it's a, it's a catch bond, the single molecule. Uh, for catenin, uh, they didn't show if it was a single molecule or multiple molecule. So here, the advantage of our system is the uh, high temporal resolution, so we can see the very brief interactions of the single molecule that probably is not visible in other setups. Uh, yes, I mean, they, they are uh, usually more elongated when they are, the density is lower and then when they become crowded, they tend to be more regular, more uh, hexagonal, more, uh, yes, there is also a change in shape, uh, uh, which is, uh, yeah, something uh, I think is not well understood also.
Thank you. Okay, so now we have another long talk by Kathleen Davis. Is this your cell phone? Hi, it's great to be here. So um, for all of the trainees, I was a postdoc at UIUC and part of the Polls Network, and now I'm an assistant professor at Yale University, so it's great to be back um, and participating and sharing some of the work that we're doing um, in my lab at Yale. Um, I don't do single molecule work, but I do work in single cells and I work on proteins, so I guess that's how my research fits into this talk. Uh, so traditionally, we study uh, proteins in, in vitro and aqueous solution, but we know that the cell doesn't look like that. About 60 to 70% of a cell's volume is made up of water. Another 8% is made up of small organic molecules and metabolites, and the other 22% is made up of nucleic acids and proteins. So inside cells, there's a tug of war between steric crowding interactions that are stabilizing and non-steric sticking interactions that can be attractive or repulsive, and they can be stabilizing or destabilizing. And because of this, it's difficult to uh, predict the stability of proteins inside cells. So in order to understand protein behaviors inside cells, we need ways to study them in their native environment. And the protein I'm gonna tell you about today is phosphoglycerate kinase, or uh, PGK. This is a great model protein for um, studying in cells because it's ubiquitously expressed across many different cell types. It's involved in step seven of glycolysis. And for protein folding, it's great because it folds in vitro in the absence of any other molecules or chaperones. So we can study its folding in vitro and in cells. The version of PGK that uh, we'll start with is yeast PGK. It has a stability of around 55 degrees, but to be able to study its folding at physiological temperatures, we destabilize it by making some mutations to the surface of the protein away from the active site. And the first question that we wanted to ask is, do in vitro observations translate to cells? In order to do this, we need a way to study protein behaviors in cells, and we do this using a technique cost called fast relaxation imaging, uh, developed in Martin Grubler's lab at UIUC. So we can study the thermodynamics of our protein by expressing it in cell or uh, looking at it in vitro on a microscope and resistively heating that uh, sample and looking at changes in fret with temperature. And if we do this in vitro and in cells, what we see in general as we move from in vitro to in cell is that our donor over acceptor ratios are lower so that we have more acceptor or we're in a higher fret state. So our, in general, uh, configurations are more compacted inside cells. And this makes sense because crowding is going to uh, compact the configurations of the proteins that we see in cells. Secondly, we see that our protein is slightly stabilized in cells, and this is also consistent with crowding. And then at high temperatures, we see that there's a turnover in the D over A, and that's consistent with aggregation upon unfolding of our protein. But we're not just interested in thermodynamic information inside cells, we also want to be able to get kinetic information in cells. And to do that, we couple our microscope with a temperature jump. So here we incorporate a two micron fiber laser that can heat our sample on a time scale faster than the dynamics of interest. So this heating laser is gonna heat our sample in about 100 milliseconds, and this will give us a window in which we can capture uh, dynamics of our protein in cells. And the advantage of doing this on a microscope is that we can get both spatial and temporal information. So here I'm showing you PGK expressed in the cytosol of a cell, and this image can be analyzed pixel by pixel or be segmented into different areas of interest, for example, into the cytoplasm in the nucleus. And I'll talk you through what this experiment looks like. The first arrow is gonna be where the uh, temperature jump is induced, and the color is telling us about the state of the protein. So we're starting folded. So here we have our temperature jump, and now we're monitoring as the protein populations to relax to the new equilibrium at the higher temperature. Once everything is fully equilibrated, this is gonna flatten out, so we're now at that thermodynamic equilibrium, and then we can release this temperature jump and monitor as the protein populations return to the initial temperature. And as we watch this, what we see is that we're actually going to return to the same initial value, and that tells us that folding is reversible between these two temperatures. 
And this particular protein's folding can be fit to a two-state model. So we, uh, it's unimolecular, and we expect to see single exponential kinetics. And so we can go back in here, and we can fit this to a single exponential and extract our folding and unfolding dynamics from this. And when we do this and we compare in vitro and in cell, what we see is that if we look at the folding dynamics, there's very little difference in the dynamics collected in vitro versus in cell. So this tells us that classic in vitro measurement and dilute aqueous solution adequately reproduce the folding mechanism of cells. But I also told you that the cells stabilize and compacted PGK. So this suggests that structure-dependent measurements, like catalytic activity, should be carried out in the presence of crowders. And indeed, if you study the activity of PGK in the presence of crowders in vitro, it can enhance its activity by about 50-fold. And so the best in vitro approach is going to depend on the question that's being asked. If you were asking a question about the folding mechanism, our dilute traditional measurements did a great job. If we're asking a question that depends on structure, then that may not be the case. And so this led us to the question is, are protein behaviors cytosol specific? So the measurements that I just showed you were conducted in a mammalian cell cytosol, but we know that not all cytosols are the same. The coli cytosols are very crowded. There's around 400 mg per mil protein in the a coli cytosol compared to around 150 mg per mil protein in the mammalian cytosol. What that means is that every protein in, in an E. coli cytosol is interacting with at least one other protein at all times, whereas in the mammalian cell cytosol, that's less than 0.3 per protein. Because of this, uh, proteins in the E. coli cytoplasm are thought to have developed smaller and less diverse complexes because it's not advantageous for them to interact with other proteins. They'd be searching those surfaces forever and they would never find their binding partner. Whereas in a, a mammalian cell cytosol, where they're less likely to find their binding partner, it's more advantageous for them to search at the surface of, their pro of other proteins for their binding partner. Because of this, proteins in E. coli are thought to have less environmental sensitivity, whereas proteins in the mammalian cell cytosol might have more environmental sensitivity. And this idea is thought to be a fifth level of protein structure. So we know about primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure, and this would be quinary structure the structure that's been uh, evolved at the surface of proteins to accommodate differences in the cell cytosol. And this is an interesting idea because recently some work came out of Doug Barrick's group where he designed consensus sequences of proteins and one of those was a consensus PGK. He found f over 5,000 extant sequences of PGK and lined them up in a multiple sequence alignment and designed a consensus sequence. And what this does is that as long as there's no coupling in the sequence, it maximizes the stability and the function of the protein. And what we see when we look at what's conserved in these proteins is that the hydrophobic core is conserved and the active site is conserved. But the surface of the protein is not conserved. And if we think about quinary structure, what we've done is we've lost that in our multiple sequence alignment. We've averaged that acro out across all of these different species. And so this would say that those weakly conserved uh, residues at the surface are not important because we get a high stability and function when we eliminate this. But I would argue that these are actually really important for these proteins to function in the cytosol and to deal with differences in those local environmental changes. To test this, we went ahead and we created consensus sequences for different kinds of organisms. So we created phylogenetic trees for different types of species, so for looking at mammals or bacteria, and then we calculated those same surface properties for those protein, uh, uh, for those different consensus proteins. Our hypothesis is that there should be a difference between this consensus sequence where all of that quinary structure is removed and from our most crowded cytosol, the E. coli, where it really has to accommodate all of these interactions inside cells. And if we look at these sequences, the biggest difference comes in the charge. And it doesn't come from total charge. So if we look at uh, the trend here in our different sequences, uh, there's not a clear trend between bacteria and consensus. It's not in the net charge or in the negative charge. It's in the positive charge in these sequences and at the surface. So our hypothesis is that a high degree of positive charge at the surface is going to correlate with a very sensitive um, stability of the protein. So large swings in the stability as we make small environmental changes. 
So we went ahead and we selected a representative from each of these classes, and these are some of our favorite or, uh, model organisms to work with, E. coli, human, zebrafish, yeast, and consensus, and we see that those uh, same trends in the surface properties match in these sequences. And there's uh, very little difference in the hydrophobic uh, content at the surface of these sequences. It's all found in, in the uh, surface, which makes this a great protein for testing uh, this hypothesis. We went ahead and we expressed fret-labeled versions of all of these proteins, and we studied their stability in vitro, in the mammalian cell cytosol, and in the E. coli cytosol. And what we see is when we take our E. coli sequence, or E. coli PGK, and we move it from environment to environment, it's very robust. Its stability is not changing. But when we look at our consensus sequence, or our yeast sequence, that had a high percentage of uh, positive surface charge, we see big swings in the stability of these proteins when we move from environment to environment. And then for zebrafish and human, we see that that's somewhere in, betw in between. And we can look at this in a more quantitative way. So here, I'm reminding you of what those positive surface charges were, the in vitro melting temperatures, as well as those swings in temperature. So when we move into the mammalian cell cytosol, there's not much of a change for any of the proteins. And this is relatively dilute, so we're not forcing very many interactions. Where we start to see large swings in the stability is when we move into that crowded E. coli cytosol. To better understand this, we also analyze the kinetics associated with this process. And when we look at our eukaryotic proteins, when we move from in vitro to in cell, we see that our system is folding faster and unfolding slower. And this is consistent with uh, crowding, dominating um, the, the change in the dynamics between these two systems. And when we look at our bacterial protein, what we see is that it's folding slower and unfolding faster. And this is allowing the protein to maintain its stability. This is consistent with chemical interactions dominating um, the, the uh, stability of this protein. And so crowding is going to be the dominating effect for eukaryotic proteins in a eukaryotic cell, whereas these sticking interactions are going to be dominating for a prokaryotic protein in a eukaryotic cell. So I think this is a really interesting thing to be thinking about uh, when we're trying to predict how protein stabilities are changed when they move into cells or into different environments. I also wanted to uh, touch on, in the last couple of minutes, other things that we're working on in my lab at Yale, so we're not just looking at protein folding. Uh, we're also developing super-resolution infrared imaging techniques to track metabolic pro processes in cells. Um, and these are some images taken from uh, studies of de novo lipogenesis uh, in fat cells. And we're also looking at thermal adaptation and uh, acclimation by organisms, so we're studying um, tardigrades, which have survived five mass extinction events, as well as zebrafish um, that can survive anywhere from zero to 40 degrees to understand how they protect proteins um, in their native environment. And with that, I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. This was very interesting. Are there any questions? I see two. Okay, let's start from here. So that's why we're studying zebrafish, so that we can look for those cold denatured states. Um, but we can't do that in a mammalian cell and keep it alive. In vitro we can, and yes, in vitro you can uh, unfold proteins. It depends on the protein, right? So many proteins unfold below zero. So you could change, what? Uh, not on this one, but we also study yeast for taxin and it unfolds at seven degrees. Yeah, the volume change of the protein or the volume change of the cell? The... Ah, so... So we can get an idea about that looking at these curves. 
So the relative compaction here, so the extended states are much more compacted uh, in cells compared to in vitro. Um, if, if we were to estimate from this by as much as 50%, uh, but both of them are going down. So the change in the end-to-end, -end, the actual delta and the end-to-end -end distance remains the same, but the overall compaction, uh, everything is shifted down by the same amount. That helps you. I see there are other questions, but maybe we can move, I also have one for you, okay. maybe we can move that to the coffee break. I'm sorry. Thank you. To, okay. Now we are back to the short talks, and here we have uh, Deepti Kailash. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Deepthi. I am finishing my first year in the biophysics PhD program at Princeton. Um, so I'm very excited to tell you a brief overview about the ideas behind my developing thesis project, which starts with this movie up here. So here you see a DNA locus, which is the bright spot in the middle, producing mRNA molecules in a living fly embryo. So I'm interested to see whether I can use data like this to get some deep quantitative understandings into the central dogma. So revisiting the central dogma, um, you know, this is something we learn in introductory biology, which is transcription and translation, bring DNA to RNA to protein. But this, these processes are not accurately described by a simple diagram, they're very complicated. So today we're going to focus on transcription and especially the dynamics behind that forward arrow. So we do these experiments in the fly embryo, which we use as a physics laboratory for a few different reasons that I'll briefly mention here. Um, but the fly embryo is a really incredible system. The development is very well characterized and very robust. So this is just one phase of embryonic development called cleavage where the nuclei share a common cytoplasm and over 14 nuclear cycles they divide and continue to share that same space. Um, and we know the time that each of those cycles takes as well. We also have a lot of knowledge on the genes that are important for the embryo and pattern development. So all of the experiments you'll see today are done on hunchback. Um, and we also have the MS2 reporter system, which was mentioned in the talks on Monday, but simplifying this a lot due to time, basically when the transcript is being transcribed, it forms a stem loop, and that's where the GFP actually binds, and that's what we can see. So this allows us to see individual transcripts. And in the analysis, we can apply our physics tools on the biological system. So this is two photon data collected by a former grad student from the lab. So there you can see the bright green dots are transcription initiation sites. And if you take any of those initiation sites and you plot the intensity over time, you get the graph on the top here. And if you deconvolve this data with the average elongation rate, you can pull out the initiation events, which are these dim gray bars here. However, the two photon microscope is not fast enough to count and track single molecules. So this is the same movie from the beginning uh, where it's imaged at 11 hertz in 2D. Um, it looks great, but we're not able to get tracks long enough to tell anything from them. So we needed to go faster, and that's why the lab built a light sheet oblique plane microscope. So this is not our design. This was followed from a design that came out a few years ago. Um, again, this is very complicated, so I'm happy to talk about it after, but basically there's a light sheet that scans at an angle across the sample, and because of the various optical components, we're able to image very quickly with low photo bleaching and high resolution. So in a 2D image, um, this is what it looks like. I just zoomed in on a nucleus, so you can see the initiation site and the mRNA molecules. And in a 3D projected image, this is what that looks like. Um, so this goes for a minute and a half, but the very bright spots you see are the initiation sites, and then you can see smaller, dimmer particles in the background. So again, this is reconstructed and um, projected. 
But this is imaged at 11 hertz in 3D. So we went from 11 hertz in 2D on the two photon to 11 hertz in 3D. <coughs> um, but you'll notice that some bleaching does occur, so that is also still being optimized. So I've only been working on this for about four months, um, so I'm not super confident enough to show results here, um, but hopefully soon. But with the OPM system, I really hope to be able to disentangle the spatiotemporal distribution of the mRNA molecules from the different sub-processes of transcription, from initiation, oh, elongation, man. termination, as well as export from the nucleus to the cytoplasm and localization within the cytoplasm. And this will offer the opportunity to probe the regulation of these sub-processes and possibly link these with establishment of the functional patterns in the embryo. So with that, I'd like to say a big thank you to my lab, especially my PI, Thomas Greger, along with Bill, Eric, and the postdocs, Kevin, Milos, and Armin. And I'm happy to take any questions now or later in the coffee hour. Thank you. Yeah, maybe in the coffee break, but very nice uh, presentation. Maybe the next one. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, everyone. I am Andrea Fontana, first year PhD student at University of Federico II, Naples. And today I am going to talk uh, about how polymer physics models can use to predict the 4D DNA organization of SARS-CoV-2 infected cells. Uh, as recently revealed by novel sequencing-based technologies, we know that DNA has a 3D complex organization in the cell nucleus which comprises a hierarchy of physical interactions um, uh, that simply represented as direct contacts between genes and distal non-coding sites that play the role of regulatory elements. Uh, this gene regulator interaction is fundamental to explain gene activity because when the contact is present, the gene is expressed. Otherwise, it is not. Furthermore, <coughs> This 3D Earth structure has a complexity that varies across different genomic scales, ranging from simple DNA loops to dense topological associated domains, named TADs, that you can see sketched uh, in the bottom of the slide, um, that serve important functional roles for the cell machinery. However, nowadays, the physical and molecular mechanisms underlying the formation of those contacts is poorly understood. Here we focus on a basic and classical biological scenario where spatial proximity among distal DNA sites arises from attractive interactions mediated by diffusing bridging molecules as envisaged by the strings and binders polymer model. To implement the SBS model of a real DNA region, we start from a self-avoiding polymer chain of non-overlapping beads, along which specific binding sites are located for cognate binders that can bridge them together. In fact, by increasing the number or the affinity of bead and binders, um, those attractive interactions result into a phase transition from a coil randomly folded to a microphase separated state in which distant globules self-assemble along the chain in correspondence of its prevailing binding domains. Uh, finally, an ensemble of equilibrium single polymer conformations is produced by performing um, molecular dynamic simulations um, by assuming the polymer chain to be subject to classical physical potentials and to be regulated by stochastic management dynamics. We considered as case study the DDX58 gene region, which is relevant in the antiviral response of human organisms. That's because it has been recently shown that this gene in severe COVID syndromes is not properly expressed, with consequent alteration in the immunological response of the host organism. By using uh, no, uh, recently published experimental proximity matrices, on the top of the slide, uh, we can observe the typical rearrangement caused by the infection. If in the non-infected case on the left, named also mock case, the gene is contained in a well-defined tag, in a well-defined domain of contacts, in the SARS-CoV-2 infected case, we can observe a weakening of those contacts. 
to quantitatively describe such differences, we use a polymer model with altered phase separation properties. In particular, we reduced bit binder affinity of about 20%. And as you can see by comparing um, uh, simulated contact maps at the bottom with the experimental one at the top that are highly correlated, the model actually captures the rearrangements caused by the infection. Uh, the model is also able to um, capture the difference in the decays of the average contract probability versus the genomic distance, that is the distance between any two bits in the region. Furthermore, as you can see from these examples of 3D snapshots of the um, uh, polymer conformations, in the mock case, the region, the gene region, is organized in three distinct tasks while these stats tend to be less localized and more intermingled in SARS-CoV-2 infected cells. We can also appreciate in the SARS-CoV-2 case an increase in the relative distance between the gene promoter and the gene enhancer, the gene regulator. And this mechanistic insight is um, in agreement with the experimental under-expression of the gene that causes the immunodeficiency. Deficiency, sorry. So, uh, with this model, we want to stress how important is the link, the connection between viral infection and DNA structure, uh, and study this link via polymer models can be <coughs> extremely insightful to understand globally the role of viral action at the level of gene regulation. Finally, I would like just to thank my collaborators at Naples and abroad to say that we have mm, postdoc positions over in our group, and Obviously, thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, Andrea. I'm afraid, again, any question, we'll have to wait until the okay. coffee break. Uh, sorry. And then, yes, the next speaker in front. Uh, now, okay, you can stand yours, perfect. We have Hena Jafari, and, okay, ready? Uh, hi, everyone, uh, my name is Hannah Jafari. I recently graduated with my PhD from Rice University. Uh, I worked with uh, Professor Peter Wallinus uh, at the Rice Center for Theoretical Biological Physics, uh, and I'm excited to discuss um, a major project from my um, uh, time at Rice uh, today with you all. So um, uh, we'll start off with just a bit of background. So um, we understand from the um, energy landscape theory that natural protein sequences are minimally frustrated, uh, meaning that um, uh, they contain um, evolutionarily conserved um, interactions that enable uh, the, uh, them to quickly and reliably reach their uh, native state. So if you look at the uh, energy landscape of uh, natural protein sequences, they look like a funnel uh, with the native state here um, uh, as an energetic minima. Uh, so the theory of uh, sorry, uh, this theory um, proposes that globally uh, proteins are minimally frustrated, but there can be some regions locally that are um, in fact frustrated. So uh, back in 2007, a postdoc of Peter um, uh, Diego Ferrero uh, sought to uh, approximate the degree of local frustration uh, for um, multiple proteins. And as we would expect, um, these proteins were covered um, with uh, minimally frustrated local interactions, uh, here indicated in green. Um, but there were some locally frustrated regions. And um, upon um, further investigation um, by Diego and other uh, collaborators, um, they found that basically there was a pretty strong uh, correlation between these frustrated sites and with biologically relevant uh, regions. So regions that are involved with allosteric um, activity, catalytic activity, binding. Uh, so in the laboratory context, um, if you um, uh, quantify the frustration uh, of a protein, that can kind of help you hone in on some regions of interest to you. Um, so given how useful um, 
the frustration calculations can be experimentally, uh, we sought to develop a um, Python package to quickly uh, um, and in a high throughput fashion calculate the frustration. So um, the package is now available, um, so I encourage you all to use it. And uh, the package, uh, you can calculate local and global frustration of uh, many uh, sequences. Uh, you can do it within um, an entire uh, structure, or you can also look at just some local, um, like protein segments, and calculate their frustration. Um, so we've already used the frustratometer in um, um, some work. Uh, so this work um, was done in collaboration with Ezekiel Galpern and Diego Ferrero at the University of Buenos Aires. And uh, we sought to calculate the, um, or we sought to basically um, uh, determine whether uh, exons, so uh, genetic um, elements that um, are uh, encoded within, uh, that are translated, right, in proteins, uh, whether exons could be independent folding units, which could be pretty important, uh, serve uh, a pretty important role evolutionarily in quickly uh, generating novel sequences uh, over evolutionary time. So we looked at multiple protein uh, exons, uh, conserved exons across multiple protein families, and uh, we found um, there were many uh, conserved exons that uh, were minimally frustrated and that they uh, were uh, pretty likely um, independent folding units. So we were pretty excited uh, by our results. I would encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's been recently uh, accepted in PNAS. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody uh, for listening to my talk and also for everybody who's been involved with this work. I'd like to give a special thank out, uh, shout out to Carlos, who's been very integral in this work, um, and everybody else that I've worked with, as well as the funding agencies. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. There's time for one question. If anyone... Uh... Uh, okay, then I have a very low-level question. Like, I assume your package is compatible with everything else in Python, like every basic. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh, like very, very basic question. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, it should be pretty should easily. Be um, yeah, it's compatible, um, and uh, but it's still in development. So, I mean, we'd appreciate any feedback. Like, um, yeah, if there are any issues, just send an email to me or Carlos. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, just check out the GitHub. So. Yeah, thank, thank you, you again. for the question. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you again. Now we have the last speaker, so I will introduce you to Dr. Jason Lee. Okay. Now we have Fausta De Santis. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So, uh, I'll try to be fast as we are, like, close to the coffee break. So, I'm Fausta De Santis, and I'm a PhD student for the Open University and the Italian Institute of Technology, based in Rome. And today, I'm here to share with you some parts of my PhD project, which tackles aggregation in a disease which is called antibody chain amyloidosis. So before I go deeper into the details of my, of my presentation, let me give you an overview of the disease we are talking about. So antibody chain amyloidosis is the most common type of systemic amyloidosis, which means that several tissues can be affected, thus uh, strongly impairing the quality and expectancy of life of the patients. It is due to the overproduction of uh, immunoglobulins, which, the overproduction of immunoglobulins by these functional B cells, and as in any aggregating disease, we have an aggregation pathway in terms of the rate of fibril formation uh, characterized by a sigmoidal trend. We have first a lag phase in which uh, dimers appear, a nucleation phase in which also higher structure uh, appears such as oligomers, and in the end we have an aggregation phase where the fibrils are finally formed and deposited. So besides the common features that drive an aggregation pathway in an aggregating disease, such as the pH or the concentration of the protein species involved, uh, here also uh, conformational changes due to mutations are, play a very important role. 
but in principle, uh, the mutation do not necessarily need to be the villain in our story. Actually, you might have both uh, germline or wild type sequences and mutant sequences, which relate to monomers, monomeric structures, which actually be in thermal equilibrium with native dimers. So monomers can actually dimerize, but also get again the um, monomeric structure quite easily. So no pathological scenario appears. But we also know that mutations sometimes like to mess up things a bit. And so misfolding event can occur. And so misfolding monomers could be keener on seizing other misfolding uh, chains, thus making, uh, giving rise to non-native dimers, which are at the beginning of the uh, cascade of events that I previously mentioned. mentioned. Uh, a peculiarity of this disease, by the way, is uh, really related to the very nature of the proteins we are talking about. Actually, antibodies have a strongly conserved structure, but on the other hand, on their surfaces, there are some regions that are strongly prone to mutation, which is, which is what makes our immune system so versatile and efficient. But this also means that every patient might develop their own mutations, uh, thus making this disease strongly patient-specific, and thus hindering the uh, study of this disease on a wider scale. So this is why I focus on a specific case, specifically its slug phase, uh, and try to obtain the structure of a putative non-native dimer. The case study I considered uh, was a patient-derived light chain, which was very well experimentally analyzed, both in terms of dynamics, uh, aggregation dynamics and structure. So the variable domain of an aggregation prone light chain extracted from a patient, sorry, uh, was crystallized. And the experimentalists were also able to retrieve the sequence of the corresponding germline non-aggregating counterpart. Uh, these two guys differ from 11 mutations. So what I did first was to perform 10 microseconds long molecular dynamic simulations in water, performing three, replica, three replicas for each monomer. Here you have a representation of the Rumi square di distribution, Rumi square deviation distribution for both the monomers, and as you can see, uh, the, pa the, the patient-derived ch like chain um, undergoes major conformational changes with respect to the germline and is able to explore a part of the configuration space which is not ex achieved by the germline. So, uh, to further inquire on this. Um, this misfolding event that we actually witnessed, which was clear that was happening, we uh, considered the adderpathic character of the molecular surfaces of the proteins. To do so, we performed an indirect assessment of the behavior of the surface residues with, uh, with the surrounding solvent. We used a hydropathy scale, which was recently developed by my team, uh, which associated a hydropathy index to each residue. And according to this scale, the higher the index, uh, the more hydrophilic the character of the residue. So according to this scale, we have the Indian isoleucine is the most hydrophobic residue, whereas asparagine is the most hydrophilic one. So I computed the, um, I uh, assessed the exposure of each residue in the sequence by calculating the uh, accessible to the solvent area for that residue, uh, averaging over the dynamics, and also computed the mean hydropathy per residue, also averaged like, for all the dynamics. Uh, here you have a representation for the, for the first replica of the germline and the mutant, and specifically for the mutant, you have the third interval of the dynamics in which we observe the major conformational changes. And looking at the top left corner of these scatter plots, uh, which correspond to the uh, mostly exposed residues and the least hydrophilic ones, we see that in the, in the, in the mutant, two hydrophobic residues are exposed, specifically an acetylocene 52 and a phenylalanine in, in position 66. Here you have a snapshot of the shifting structure and uh, how the residues are, are exposed, passing from the first part of the, of the dynamics until the, the end of the dynamics of the mutant. So thinking of the very nature of these hydrophobic residues, which for sure will not be happy to be in contact with the solvent, and thinking also of the role that, uh, that hydrophobic interfaces play in stabilizing dimerization, we speculated that actually these two residues could actually be involved in the formation of uh, pathogenic uh, interfaces. So we looked for uh, a pathogenic dimer based on this, on this idea. So we performed a hierarchical clustering of the last part of the mutant's dynamic. Here you have a representation of the abundances of the proteins for each cluster. And we docked each centroid for each centroid of the cluster. So 
looking at this pentagram, you might think, which kind of witchcraft is this? <laughs> we weren't trying to summon any kind of demon, rest assured. Uh, this is only a schematic for, to, to make clearer all the possible combination of central structure we were trying to dock. And, but we also required Addock, which was the software we used for making docking, to, um, to create the interface in such a way that they contain the newly exposed residues. So we have uh, four combinations in which both the interfaces uh, contain an azulucine 52, the case in which both the interfaces uh, contain a phenyl 66, and the mixed case. So considering all the possible combination of centroids to be docked and their uh, composition in terms of these hydrophobic residues, we ended up with 55 dock structures. And we subjected all these 55 dimers to 50 nanoseconds long molecular dynamic simulations. So inspecting these dynamics for each group, uh, we see we were looking for the most stable complex by looking, for example, to, uh, at the conserved contacts at the interface and to the interface room in square deviation. And apparently, the group of proteins of dimers uh, whose interfaces were uh, composed of both isoleucine 52 uh, were those uh, that had the most stable complexes. So we restricted our analysis to this group and we computed the lennard johnson interaction at the interface. And we selected the most stable dimer uh, considering the, the complex um, displaying the, most, uh, the major contribution in terms of lennard johnson interaction at the interface. So we selected this one complex that you see here displayed and we extended the dynamics until one microsecond. And looking at the lennard johnson interaction at the interface, we see that this is quite stable so we can be quite happy of the choice we made. So what I'm trying to do now, uh, I'm trying to shift my focus on the oligomerization phase. And uh, obviously to do so, all atom molecular dynamics is not feasible anymore. So I'm trying to use coarse graining methods. Specifically, I'm using Calvados and Martini, which are two methods that are being developed and optimized in the labs of Professor Preston Lindor Larsen at the University of Copenhagen, who I thank for having hosted me for six months. And uh, another line for my project is aimed at designing a peptide to impair demerization. So before I leave you, I would like to thank all my team. Some of them are here among you, the biomodeling group. And I would like to thank the organization team for giving me the chance to be here and for making all of this possible, which is not very not to be taken for granted in the historical period that we are living in. Not everyone has this, this luck. And thank you, of course, for your attention. Thank you, Fausta. Now there is uh, time for questions. Anyone has a, a question? Um, otherwise, uh, okay, I don't know much of the field, but how, um, like, the results you have for your protein, how much you can translate that to different? Uh, That's the issue. I mean, it's difficult to make a wide scale. So for now, we're just stuck in this, uh, this specific case. Also because there is quite lack in the literature of substructures. So you have plenty of sequences. There is a whole database which uh, contains a lot of sequences of light chains, but not actually related to substructures. And we were trying to just at least stick to some experimental data for a while. OK. Thank you for the question. Okay. Uh, let's thank Fausta and all the speakers of the sessions again. Thank you.